Recording in progress. Okay, Jeff. Okay, it looks like we have a pretty good group here. So I'm going to call the, um, I'm Jeff Vincent. I'm uh, uh, chair of the Washington Student Achievement Council, and I'm going to, I'm calling the meeting to order. Um, um, like I said, I'm Jeff Vincent, been chair of the Washington Achievement Student Achievement Council for um, a couple of years now. I'm government uh, governor appointed, um, also president of the Laird Norton Company, and I'm just going to We'll just do a quick introduction of other uh, council members on this um, Zoom meeting. Um, Jan. Morning, I'm Jan Yoshiwara, Executive Director with the State Board for Community and Technical Colleges. And then Paul. Good morning, everybody. My name is Paul Francis. I'm the Executive Director of the Council of Presidents, which represents your public four-year colleges and universities. And then I have, um, I'm looking around my room here. Oh, Terry. Good morning, everyone. Terry Standish Kion, Independent Colleges of Washington. Great. Um, the purpose of this special, purpose of this special board meeting today is to um, discuss um, uh, budget proposals that would be submitted in on uh, September 13th to OFM. Uh, something that the uh, uh, council staff has been busy working on. Uh, you had the board meeting material sent out to you ahead of time. Uh, so that's why we're calling this special meeting so that the council can have input um, into those proposals, policies, uh, into those proposals before um, they're submitted to OFM on uh, the 13th of September. Um, do We're not going to go ahead and... Um, approve the minutes today. We'll push those off to a later meeting. And with that, Mike, just to uh, manage time here well, um, I'm hoping that we maybe even get done a little bit ahead of time today. I'm going to turn it over to you because uh, we have uh, some robust discussion to have around some key proposals. Yeah. yeah uh, let, let me first have Heather give everyone a preview of the process that we go through. Uh, and, and typical and, and fashion for what we've done for a number of years at, at the Student Achievement Council to give you a process of what, what how the proposals before you got to you today. So go ahead, Heather, with that process update. Sure. Uh, Crystal, do you want to share screen? There's just a few slides <clears throat> that I'll quickly run through. Yep, next slide. So um, just a sense, we sent out invitations to more than 100 people. We had roughly 100 people participate. Um, and this gives a snapshot of the types of folks that were involved in our formal stakeholder engagement session. So actually a large number of community-based organizations, so a large number of higher ed folks. Um, and then the next slide um, shows a little bit of the feedback that we heard from the stakeholders. So we had general excitement from everyone around pretty much all of the proposals. I don't think there was any proposal that we heard uh, resistance or concern with at a, at a large scale. Uh, there was overwhelming support for the first challenge for the first proposal that you're here you're going to hear about the challenge fund. Um, and there was broad consensus around the integration of basic needs for students throughout our work, um, especially childcare as an urgent issue. Um, there was also overwhelming consensus throughout all of our discussion around the need for students and families to have more direct contact with trained navigators at a community level to ensure equity is met and basic needs are met. And then lastly, there was some concern around grant funded programs and sustainability to ensure that whatever investments the state makes, that there's sustainability to continue that. Um, Again, a note on process, uh, there were three formal feedback sessions in July and August, again, over 100 stakeholders, and then we did um, do a survey, and we had about half of the people that attended the meetings participate in the survey, and so, again, the next two slides just show some of that feedback from the surveys themselves in which people ranked the proposals as a level of priority. So the next slide shows um, 
again, that overwhelming support predominantly for the college, the career and college promise community challenge fund, um, with additional support for the other proposals, just at a slightly less um, uh, consensus level. And then the next slide shows the rankings and support for the basic needs proposals, which um, some of these proposals the council will not necessarily be hearing about today, but came out of the basic needs task force that the council heard about back in July. Um, a lot of uh, support again for increased navigation support for students. So uh, that concludes the portion of process and making sure the council was familiar with who we talked to and what we heard from folks at a high level. And I'll hand it back to Mike unless there's questions around this. The, uh, we have, you know, as, as everyone knows, we have the uh, four strategic uh, clusters in our framework of affordability and enrollment, completion and, ba and student supports or basic needs, uh, and uh, all grounded in a commitment to equity, particularly with a focus on closing race, racial and ethnic gaps. Uh, the uh, proposals before you today and that were discussed through this process come under basically two of those clusters, recognizing that these are not, you know, super bright line things. There are things that we do that will enhance, you know, enrollment that will spill over to benefit to other areas. It's just a framework, the way to think through and organize these things. So what we would like to do in keeping with that framework is we have a, we have a number of proposals that are grounded primarily in the notion of increasing enrollment in post-secondary education of all kinds in the state. And then we have a number of is, a number of proposals on student supports. We'd like to take them in those two orders of those clusters, starting with enrollment. Uh, and what we'd like to do is, if it works, uh, we will quickly walk through the items under each cluster. So we'll start with enrollment. We'll quickly walk through those and then stop for uh, you know questions and conversation, discussion, whatever. And perhaps at the end of all of this, you know, the council can you know, figure out, you know, how to, you know, give guidance or direction on our next step, because as, as uh, many of the, you know, inside state government budget baseball players, uh, WASIC as the agency will need to submit, a, you know, decision packages uh, to the budget process, uh, I believe on September 13th, but in any event in about, you know, three weeks or so. Uh, so. Do you have a question, Mike, before we keep going? Yeah, 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 Great. yeah. Uh, Heather, could you chat a little bit just about were there any gaps in the stakeholder uh, sessions, uh, groups, regions, um, someone that you had hoped to be engaged there that, that was not? Um, I think that's a, a tricky question because there's always more, more people that we can talk to. Um, I think that we were intentional in the past year or so expanding into more community-based organizations. And I feel like that was that was a success. I think we nailed that. Um, I think as the councils discussed, there's obviously more work to do to ensure we're including leaders from our BIPOC communities. And I think um, in particular, we have work to do in connecting with Native American tribal leaders in the state. Um, so I would say that's something internally the staff has been talking about in an area that you know, as the council has been discussing equity, it's a similar area of work for us. Um, that's something that stands out. We didn't necessarily, you know, go through where everybody came from when they registered. So we don't have a geographic um, sense, at least at this point. Yeah, I, I would Thanks say for reflecting on that. Yeah, yeah. And I just say speaking from a the perspective, uh, you know, I think what I saw when I arrived four to four to five years ago was a similar kind of process, but it was largely around the organized stakeholders and partners, the, the usual suspects, if you will, right? Very robust, very good conversation, a lot of players. I think, you know, Heather and others have led us in the direction of what we wanted to do, which was bring more uh, organizations, networks, people to the table who are inter very, very interested in our, in, in, you know, in our, in our educational attainment goal and our commitment to equity and all the rest and to bring more of those voices in. Uh, that's that's growing. I think we had some, you know, this is not the first time in that we've had organizations like that in these conversations, but it's clearly become a major force of that. And I want to thank, you know, everyone who was involved in that. And also just everyone involved in this meeting is, 
you know, as we continually do this over time, the way these conversations usually really grow is by a cascading word of mouth that, you know, it is worth being in these conversations and, and hearing it not just from the formal entity, us, you know, the state agency, but hearing from anyone and everyone who participates. So I'm guessing that in the community-based organization and equity advocacy world, you know, there is some positive, you know, vibe developing out there that this is a table worth coming to and spending some time. It's not a ritualistic public hearing type event. Uh, so thanks again to everyone who played a role in that, both WASIC staff and otherwise. Uh, if I'd like to go to the enrollment uh, category that and and start with the, you know the first one that that generated a lot of conversation uh, in in the stakeholder meeting is the Career and College Promise Community Challenge Fund. I'll spend a little bit more time on this one than and then we will pr probably on the others as far as the, the intro. Uh, so don't take this as a pattern that this is everyone's going to involve as much introduction as this because this is a very big proposal it's very big in the sense that it's 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 a, it's, a, it's not totally new we 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 have the council in previous budget cycles has has asked for uh the ability to make grants into the community level uh, so it's not a totally new idea at the council table uh but it is bringing it back front and center uh, in a much more ambitious way than we've ever done in the past. Uh, and I, I would start off by saying the challenge, what, what, what is the challenge, you know, not the challenge in the challenge grant, but what's the challenge, what's the problem, what's the solution we're trying to get to for the state? And that is the, the issue that I hear over and over and over again. You know, wh why with everything we have going for us in the state of Washington, strong institutions, one of the most generous state financial aid programs in the country, uh, a very strong uh, job market that is constantly seeking more and more, you know, credentialed and skilled workforce. Why do we have, uh, you know, a college going rate, you know, out of high school that's 10 points below the national average and below California and Oregon state average? Well, you know, why have we seen, you know, ever, 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 annual year after year decline in adults enrolling, particularly in community technical colleges in the last, you know, eight or nine years, you know, and this is trying to get at that issue. Uh, and the opportunity we see to address that issue is to actually, you know, not follow the notion of having the state pick a single solution or one or two or three solutions, but instead to have the state take a look at, you know, what's happening around, around our state where there's actually signs of changing these traditional patterns. And we do have that going on. There are there, like there are signs around the country. We now clearly have signs in Washington. Uh, and I would say the Seattle Promise is one example. Uh, the Chehalis Initiative uh, in South, in, in, you know, but in, in Chehalis Centralia area, which is now expanding throughout Lewis County. Uh, school district, more school district focused efforts in Toppenish and Bridgeport. They have shown the ability to drive enrollment patterns higher than one would expect. And, and some of this has, has actually happened and their most significant successes have happened in the COVID era. Uh, the key thing to these examples is they are community-based partnerships. You know, some people might think, well, isn't the Seattle Promise just about financial aid? It is grounded in financial aid, like much of this work is, but it goes way beyond that uh, to bring other players into and other types of interventions to support students' these pathways. The proposal is, and, and it's most simplest way of looking at it, is the, the idea that we, we do want to match funding. We don't want this to be a 100% state funded thing. So match funding is a way of, of determining that you have truly motivated partners. Uh, we want it to be multi-year. You know, we don't think, you know, the formation of new broader partnerships taking on innovative work is going to happen in an environment in which it's year to year and we never know whether or not we're going to get more than a year's support to do these kinds of things. So the construct in front of you, you know, is a, uh, is the notion of, uh, you know, not so much in the specific details or numbers in it, but how do we structure a process that allows us to stimulate the, the uh, emergence of new cross-sector partnerships grounded in high schools and colleges, but also community leaders, nonprofit groups, you know, and more, you know, and, and how do we entice them and, 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 and generously match their commitment to do more work on a local level on a sustained basis, not, you know, on a year by year basis. 
we we do want to do this. This is not just an allocation approach of, of taking a bunch of money and just spreading it out across the state. We want to have standards. You know, it is a competitive grant, and we want to have standards for it, which is, you know, as, as spelled out, is first of all focused on, on equity. We want partnerships to identify and develop plans to close racial and ethnic gaps. We want the partnerships to include the voices of students and parents. It's very much grounded in collaboration. We, and we want to learn what works so that the work on the ground and across the state can evolve and adapt over time. I'm going to close with just a few notes on the fund mechanics, which the fund basically, the reason why we have a fund I believe I've reconnected. I think I had a loss in internet service. Can somebody just tell me you can hear me now? Yeah, you're back. I can hear you now. Okay. okay, sorry. I'm getting that infamous, your internet connection is unstable, Warren. Uh, so I uh, had to move to a different location. Uh, so I, you know, I'm going to close by saying the mechanics of the fund is, is you know, it, it's, 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 it's a $250 million appropriation ask which in part is driven by the amount of funds that are available now to the state between state and federal sources. Uh, it is not a $250 million spend, you know, in a year. We're proposing 10 years, so we're saying it's about $25 million a year on average. We, you know, it won't be the same every year. We can't get out of the box in the first year at the full amount. Uh, but the fund is basically a mechanism uh, that obviously will need exploration and detailing within the, again, well, like I say, the inside baseball budgeting and appropriations as to how to make this work as a reliable, sustainable commitment with community partners. Uh, so that's, that's the Community Challenge Fund. The Career and College Advising Fellowship is an, an, uh, a proposal that's been before the council, the council has adopted in the past. Uh, which is to expand our existing state work study program. It is a new name to call it the Career and College Advising Fellowship. Is to get a little brand name, bump it up. But that's the, but we're basically proposing sufficient funding to fund 300 slots in which college students would have work study uh, jobs to work in support of college going. Uh, they could work in support of high, uh, high school students or adults. You know. Uh, to enroll in college, probably people like themselves, though that will be up to the people actually doing the work. Uh, and the key elements as in the past are that we would, this would be focused on school districts, colleges, uh, and community-based nonprofits and other groups like that as the employer, and the employer match would be waived, unlike the, the current employer match requirement for, for businesses. Uh, the third item is the student-facing career and college planning app. This is a conversation that emerged collaboratively with several regions in the state. Uh, the most advanced is the King County Promise that's in formation. Uh, we've also had conversations in other areas of the state, both around you know, Spokane, southwest part of the state around Vancouver and others who are interested in models that are emerging around the country, particularly one that the Dallas Promise Program, the Dallas Community Colleges in partnership with others have up and running in Greater Dallas, which gives high school students a basically an app based view of information that they need to in order to navigate their pathway to post secondary enrollment, but particularly grounded in the ability to see all of their transcript and other key data in one place. Uh, so, uh, and it's, it's, it's shown some very promising utilization and excitement by students in the Dallas area, the King County Promise. People are very, very interested. Of course, they do have their own, you know, separate source of funding for some of this. So we're, we're, the proposal basically is for the state to be a funding partner with regions that want to do this, because we think it has the opportunity to be, you know, uh, a, a, a modest investment overall, but a game changer in empowering students to, to, and, and to map their own futures and to and in empowering them, enable them to share this information with family members, advisors, mentors, you know, and others. Uh, and then the fourth item uh, that I, I will, you know, explain quickly is, is Otterbot texting. As you know, we've been doing now for several years, deploying this chatbot into 12th graders in the College Bound Scholarship Program. 
Again, the, the utilization of it and the intensity of utilization has been extremely exciting. It helps them think through financial aid and understand financial aid processes and college application. We're asking to extend it to earlier years, uh, 11th grade, 10th grade, 9th grade, recognizing that uh, these are pathways. It doesn't all happen in senior year. And it would be good to engage students in the medium that they are most happy to engage in, which is texting, not email, not snail mail, but texting uh, in a 24-7 responsive environment you know, that works for them. I'm going to turn the college and the high school uh, proposal over to Heather. Thanks, Mike. Um, this proposal is a policy position. It is not a budgetary request to the council um, and stems from the dual credit task force work. Um, the recommendation is for the council to support fully funding the college and the high school program so that all low income students who are participating in college and the high school don't have to pay for the tuition costs as well as eliminating the costs associated um, with books and other types of fees that um, is suggested that potentially K-12 could help with some of those costs. Um, the state suggestion is that there would also be uh, covering additional types of college and the high school type programs like P-TECH um, that support that career connected learning towards the post-secondary credential. And again, this is something that um, you know, council has obviously been discussing for a long period of time and has been a, a consensus out of the dual credit task force that uh, low income students should not have to pay for those uh, fees associated with college and the high school. And that concludes our enrollment proposals. And I think we're going to pause here for discussion and questions before we move on to the basic needs proposals. So, Jeff, I'll hand it back to you. Yeah, let's just open it up to questions to council members and to our audience. Questions? Uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, um, I, I have a question. So do you want uh, uh, comments now on the... Um, I have a couple of edits. I, I support these items, but I have a couple of edits to the first one on ca career and college promise community challenge fund. Do you want me to go through that now or do you want me to wait uh, for us to go through that document? So Mike, how would you like to handle this? Yeah. How, how about this? There, maybe there are none, but but if there are any you know, like more more informational questions, maybe we can clear that out and then get to, you know, suggestions for changes or any okay. more or, or just general comments. So I don't know if anyone does have informational questions about any of the five items. Yeah, any quite clarification questions, things you'd just like to better understand. Mike, I'm not okay. seeing anything. Yep, yep. So, Paul, why don't you go at it? Okay, um, like I said, I, I think the uh, Community Challenge Fund is of great need to students, uh, you know, just given the pandemic and uh, Mike, some of the challenges you have outlined in our state. So certainly support it. I have a couple of edits here, uh, not to get into wordsmithing. I know we all love to do that, but um, uh, uh, on page uh, uh, three here, when it says create a two, uh, 2D, create an advisory or governing committee that includes students, parents, or leaders. I think advisory committee is great. I think it makes a lot of sense. I think a governing committee, in my opinion, that's the role of the legislature. That's the role of the governor's office and OFM. Um, I think that that's uh, much more challenging. So my recommendation there would just be to keep advisory committee rather than um, uh, governing committee. And then the second one is on the next page. And um, so that concerns the one uh, related to uh, a 2J, considered dual generation strategies. I think that we're unnecessarily limiting ourselves um, there. So I pasted uh, some, some proposed language in the chat uh, because the, the J is, a, is a, it's written now focuses on parents of students um, who don't have a, a post-secondary credential, which I think is really important, but as a council, we've talked about the value in, in how do we engage everybody 
um, who doesn't have a, a credential. So I've, I've got some language are focused on ages 25 to 44, which is part of our uh, goals. So, um, and then I added the word advanced because I, every other one has an action word. And so I thought that was important here too. So thank you for considering. So um, Mike or Heather, if somebody from staff on the um, Paul's change on a um, governing versus uh, inserting by advisory what, what's the thought on why you chose the word governing versus an advice is there a distinction well it, what what in fact i was actually teeing the issue up so it, this is this is sort of a sometimes when i'm when we're putting together documents there'll be something that we think about should we pick a or b you know but sometimes if you put a draft in front of a body like the council if you just go with b it may not be as clear to you that there's this a b choice and so here we thought we actually wanted to tee this issue up for your input uh, and don't and we're, we, we don't have like a strong feeling one way or the other if you're more comfortable with advisory which may in fact be the way it you know i, I can certainly see an advisory committee is a much easier thing for a local partnership to execute someone's going to have to sort of be the fiscal you know uh a fiscal agency, if you will, on the on a grant, you know, that kind of stuff. But so to me, it's like you, you give us your guidance and we're happy to do that on the, uh, yeah, on that one for sure. That was just teeing it up for you to be aware of maybe there's a choice here, you know. Uh, Jan, uh, Terry. I think um, these are really great proposals and um, I think they, they tackle the, uh, I thought the um, the case for support was really well written, and um, you know I know that <clears throat> the other day I asked a lot of questions about the community challenge fund. I was trying to understand how it operated, and I apologize I hadn't read the material yet, um, uh, but I did read it over the weekend, and um, I you know I I think it's a it's a different approach to how we're um, we're trying to do things in terms of getting people to enroll in college. And I think we need some different approaches. Um, and so I, it's interesting, the order in which these are, are written, I don't know if that was intentional or not. It seems to line up with the feedback from the stakeholders. Um, and, um, you know, I, I don't have any particular questions about it at the moment. Okay. Um, yeah. So I'm going to, um, I, I think these are really terrific. So do you have any views on the advisory versus governing distinction on the, on the first one? Um, you know, I was trying to find it on the, I was scrolling through the document as you were talking, Paul. So um, I was trying to figure out where it was. Um, I, I do think that, what I understood was that the, the council itself is going to be making significant decisions right. about this fund. And so from that sense, the council is the governing body. And um, I think we may want to um, get uh, some strong advice from this, uh, from the group of um, constituencies that are, are named here. Yeah. But I do think the council Okay. Uh, is maintains responsibility for this fund. Okay, okay. thanks, Jan. And Terry, what's your view on advisory versus governing or any other comments you'd have? So really wanted to, uh, to commend this idea first and foremost of looking at what works, looking out to our campuses that are uh, really invested already in this work and have, uh, have been engaged in some good conversations. Uh, I prefer advisory, and I think, uh, Jan, you're looking at uh, number 2D. I think you'll find uh, advising versus uh, governing. And I think one of the important models or the important considerations that we haven't seen, I think, as thoroughly investigated as we could around the state of Washington is making sure that students are able to access any type of higher education or post-secondary that best meets their needs so that we're not um, only supporting particular higher education decisions. Um, so just would want that to be included in uh, this work going forward. Um, I know, for example, that that here at the Seattle Promise is very focused uh, on students going to our local uh, community colleges to start with, 
uh, again, it might be that students would find uh, the program that works best for them outside of the region or at a four-year institution. And I just wanna make sure that we're cognizant of that going forward. Okay, so listening to that, Mike, I think uh, I think the preference is uh, advisory versus governance. Right, right. I, I assume on the dual generation piece, I don't think, given how the council has talked about this in the past, that that's a controversial amendment at all. Not to I think I think the intent is around what Terry just said is to really do something like that. So um, I think you know those are Paula a couple of changes that I think make sense, and I think we'd um, just given the sense of what I just heard here, we changes we should make. So I guess want to open it up for other questions or comments. And Jeff, if I can just quickly, Jan raised a really important point that I neglected to mention in the quick intro, which is that the vision here is that the agency, the staff, would not be making grant awards or running this competition, that this is the, that like what, the way that, it, depending upon, of course, what ultimately gets adopted, if anything, is that the council would approve a set of more detailed rules for applications and awards uh, after after adoption, and then the council would actually be the granting, you know, the decision maker on on the grant awards, and that that would enable you also to bring in others, both in any step of the way, as as a advisory uh, stakeholders, or whatever, to work with council staff on doing this in a way that makes sense, because we are striving for a you know the sort of statewide effort uh, as 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 structured and, and and decided upon by the council not an agency initiative. So I want to thank Jan for bringing that point out. And I thought for, especially for the audience members, it might be good to hear that that's a very explicit intent here. Okay. So, so Mike, g given this, I mean, how would you like, would you, you know, this was very well written, I think got out to the members. We had a few comments. How would you like to handle it from here? Uh, I think we can move into there's 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 a, a smaller number of items on the uh, the uh, student supports list. I think we can then if if we're finished and I'm totally open to any of course obviously what anyone wants to do going forward. But when we're finished with this enrollment cluster of five items, we can move on to student supports and then after discussing that, we can perhaps put a motion you know, on the table to approve the whole package, you know, okay. and of course, based on the changes that we've already talked about and one is Paul, okay. one's Paul's point on. So before we move to student support, any further comments or about these five initiatives? Looking around the room, I'm not hearing anything, Mike. So I think we can go to student supports. Okay, I'll turn that over to Heather. Okay, so just as a note, these uh, proposals came from the basic needs task force that, again, you all heard from in the July meeting. So the first proposal is to expand the currently existing pilots to ensure that all students experiencing homelessness have the resources necessary at the institutions. Uh, the budget request would be for WASAC to expand to $400,000 so that we could expand to the public baccalaureate institutions. Um, but from a policy position, the recommendation is to support all those students um, in the other pilot institutions and expand so all those institutions are able to support homeless students. And this has uh, been going on for the past two years and we've seen uh, tremendous results with the institutions. Leadership has really come together, case management, wraparound support services, um, a tremendous amount of learning thus far. And so the recommendation is we need to learn from all of our institutions. They're all individual, have their own needs and everything with the pandemic has seen the experience for students um, facing housing insecurity exacerbated. And we know in particular for students of color, it is exacerbated. Um, so this is um, the only budgetary uh, request to the council. Um, and I'll go to the next one and um, then we can break for discussion and questions and I'll lean on Amy and others to, to fill in the gaps here. 
Um, the other one, again, we've been discussing for a while um, with the council is to ensure that as a state, we can capture that baseline data around how many students are experiencing unmet needs. So um, this, again, is a policy position that um, we recommend that Institutions have survey questions that would go out to students, um, that uh, uh, the data would be disaggregated, so we would be able to determine um, demographics as well as regional uh, disparities that might exist, and that this uh, survey out to students at institutions would allow us to see at a full state level how many students across all of our institutions are experiencing unmet needs based off of food, housing, child care, mental health care, um, and again, that also coming out of the, the basic needs task force that um, Amy has been leading. Um, so those are the those are the two. Um, and I'll pause there to see if there's any questions or comments. Heather, this is Terry. Um, I'd love to hear and, and perhaps uh, even go as far as, as recommend that in this, uh, when we do go forward, the council goes forward with expanding the pilot that we uh, make sure that there could be some funding that could be competitively uh, awarded for independent private not-for-profit students go experiencing homelessness, um, much like we did. There's a model back from 65, uh, 14, I believe it was, when the state and WASAC made uh, competitive funds available for uh, student mental health. I think that, uh, that there's a really good model there uh, that we could learn some things if there was uh, the option for some competitive funds. So any, Mike or Heather, any, had any thought been given to that? Or is there any issues with that? Uh, no, I don't think there's any issues. That would be a, um, you know, we can put in proposals for the agency. So this is expanding what we currently do with public baccalaureates. The existing legislation doesn't include funding for, for private. So that would be a new both budget and I think legislative request to have that expansion. Yeah. So it'd be modifying the current proposal. Uh, yeah, if you directed us to do that, we would do it. You know, there's no. Yeah, that was supported by the task force. The task force was really all institutions should be able to participate in providing these services to students. It's just for purposes of what already exists and, and WASAC's role. So, Mike, does that complicate this going to as a request or is that, and then how would we think about sizing that? I, uh... No, I mean, well, obviously, yeah, there, I mean, it, but it more only in a technical sense that yes, you know, as a, as a staff, we'd have to develop a bit more of a the decision package becomes a bit longer because it's going to require some language changes and, and, and it's going to require some additional money, or we'd be shrinking the size of the rolling over the existing pilots. So we would do both of that. I won't get into any speculation on complications of outcome results probably whatever you know but but no I, I don't think any I don't think you have to worry about that uh, as the council uh, I think you you know if you want to include that you let us know you can you know, tell us that and we will do that you know so so jam Paul reactions um well first of all I think these two are terrific so thanks so much you know the, the work the wasac is doing around basic needs is really outstanding in the learning community so um, I think it's great. Um, regard, related to Terry's suggestion, I'm supportive as long as it doesn't negatively impact the request related to students at my institution. So, and which Terry, I don't think is your intent. I think your intent is to expand the pie here. So as long as that's what we're talking about, I'm supportive. Yes. I assume Terry, that's what you meant. Where is that unmute button when you can find it fast enough? Yes, that is my intent. Okay, and then Jan, any thoughts or comments on that? Um, I agree, and um, you know we uh, we've had some conversations. We're we are um, going to be meeting with the state board for community and technical colleges on Friday uh, to get uh, my board's approval on our supplemental budget requests and. Um, expansion of the, the homeless uh, pilot program to all of our institutions is 
uh, will be seriously considered. So I really appreciate the um, initiative of the Student Achievement Council and um, uh, hope that uh, we can make a policy statement about making this available uh, to homeless students at all institutions. So Mike, just hearing that and giving the sense of the of the members of the council were on this Zoom meeting, I would um, say that we would expand it to include private um, four-year public institutions. I mean, private inst uh, four-year institutions, and you know, with the idea that it's it's incremental to the the current ask. Right. Got it. Yep. Okay. And and one th information, I mean, we talked a little bit about this Friday. Uh, we're, we're also willing, I mean, his, this, this was structured as WASIC does the four years and uh, public four years and C SBCTC does the public two years. Uh, if, if down over the next week or so, Jan, you know, we're, we're, we sort of made the offer to Jan SBCTC. If for any reason you want us in our DP to ask for the money for us to simply transfer it to you, you know, we, we're, we're prepared to do whatever makes sense, or we just have the policy line. You ask for it, and we have the policy language supportive of either way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. Any other comments or questions uh, from, again, members or from the audience uh, today around the student support uh, proposals? Mike, I'm looking at people, looking at the screen. I'm not hearing anything. Yeah. So, oh, no, you got a hand up somewhere there. Yeah. Uh, do we? Okay, so. Uh, hi there. I think that's my hand. Uh, my name is Rayanne. I'm a Washington uh, State University student, uh, graduate student, and I'm the graduate and professional uh, vice president for Washington uh, Student Association. I just wanted to know if, in in particular, the basic needs. Uh, assessment if graduate students will be included in any way. Hello, great. Mike. That's a, that's a great question. I'm going to hand uh, Amy, see if I can turn that over to you to respond. Hi, Rianne. This is Amy Magasos with the WASAC Policy and Planning. Um, we this spring facilitated a statewide work group on this uh, basic needs assessment question. Um, and that included um, both um, public and independent baccalaureates as well as the CTC sector. Um, the question of graduate students was not brought up um, in that work group um, planning, but the structure that was discussed around the state assessment um, was uh, that institutions would use a common um, instrument, which this work group did uh, draft um, and is sharing for feedback, and the institutions would field that. Um, they could decide to field it also with graduate students, and they would submit data um, to ERDC and WASAC um, for, uh, in an aggregate way to look at um, the state prevalence of unmet basic needs. So that was the work group's recommendation and they did not um, create a, a, a recommendation around graduate students, but I think at least on an institutional level, um, that could be a decision of an institution. Um, I know that University of Washington did include them in its 2019 assessment um, of uh, homelessness and housing insecurity. Um, and that could be you know, a policy decision um, statewide that we would also like to assess um, basic needs um, inclusive of graduate students. I hope that helps with your question. Thank you so much for your answer. And I'll just um, then transition to a quick statement of I just want to encourage us to include graduate students. I know we're oftentimes overlooked, but uh, uh, graduate students do uh, oftentimes uh, struggle to meet even basic needs like childcare, housing, and uh, food insecurity and healthcare. Uh, so thank you so much. So Paul, Jan, Terry, what's your, um, right now way is set up. It sounds like it's up to the each 
individual institu institution when doing the survey to determine if they're going to include graduate students or not? What's the view? Should that be, uh, should we make it part of a policy statement, which is, is part of the, uh, making them part of the survey group? Uh, Mr. Chair, I think my, yeah, Rianne, I'm really glad you, you mentioned that because there, there is a huge need among graduate students. So first of all, pleasure to meet you. <laughs> um, second of all, I think we should add some language, at least recommending that that be part of any type of uh, survey. Amy's absolutely right that some campuses have explicitly included graduate students, others have not. Um, so I think at least a recognition um, and then, Rianne, let's get you included into some of these work groups so that we can make sure the graduate student voice is there. But um, certainly my recommendation as I talk to my campuses as we go forward is that they all include graduate students in surveys. The challenge there is that uh, surveys can be a little bit challenging because there are, um, you have to think about timing and fatigue. The legislature directs us to survey um, students related to a variety of things, suicide, campus sexual violence, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why I appreciate the flexibility there for each institution to be able to do that. But at the same time, we need data. So um, I think including some language is, a, is, is worth thinking about. Thank you. Okay. Jan, Terry. Well, we don't have graduate students at community and technical colleges. Um, however, um, you know, I think um, having a, a comprehensive view of what students, ch the challenges are for our students makes sense. Okay. How about you, Jerry? And similarly, I think encouraging campuses, I, I think uh, all the way through all of these conversations, it's been really terrific to hear the experience, the lived experience of our campuses and our campus colleagues certainly know their students best. Um, but some language around encouraging makes a lot of sense. Okay. So, Mike, does, do you have that recorded? Yes. Okay. Right. Then so, there's a, uh, someone does. <laughs> okay. There, there was a question that came up in um, chat about the, do these proposals include the required staffing necessary at WASIC to support them? Yeah, as I mean, you know, traditionally uh, the council conversations and the uh, decisions around these things are are focused on the policy, you know, and and the new spending items. Yeah, with on staffing, we usually like any state agency deal with OFM, the legislative staff, et cetera, on appropriate staffing to carry out our duties. I think there's yeah, we will be asking for some additional positions, uh, you know, depending upon what comes through in this package, you know, so. For, for example, things like the, the homelessness pilot in the past, that was a new thing a couple of years ago. We were able to do that with an existing you know, staff capacity, uh, though with the caution that it's like, yeah, we can do one new thing, we can do two new things, maybe depending on where they go. But you know, the, the, sometimes there's a tendency to suddenly have five or six new things. That is not, it's not any one of them, it's accumulation of the five or six. You know? So part of that is, is, is staying on top of things as they develop the session. But on the challenge grant, you know, if we are going to staff it in the way to make it be the robust and, and ambitious uh, effort that we're speaking about, that we're going to staff in a way to empower stakeholders and work with regions and work with the council and support the council decision making role. Yeah, it's going to take, a, you know, positions to add. And, we, we, and like I said, we'll work that out with OFM and legis the legislature and the like. Okay, great. Other questions about the student support proposals from uh, the um, from our council or from the our guest today. Um, I see any hands up or anything. So, Mike, um, I think we've had comments now on both sections um, on enrollment and student supports. Uh, what would you suggest that we do now? Well, if we can, if we have a, a motion from the council endorsing that, as as you know, some know some of the, we have some council members who couldn't be at this meeting right now, though they're aware of all this, uh, either either because of their they actually they actually have a teaching administrator position in the school or uh, you know uh, maternity uh, parental leave or some other things. So what we like to do, if you you take a motion, uh, adopt a motion endorsing these. You know, then obviously this, we'll move forward on the on the process things we have to do. But then we'll also ha have an opportunity to bring into the for the record 
you know, the indication from other council members who couldn't be okay. with us today. So, okay, so do I have a motion from the council um, to approve the policy proposals for both enrollment and student supports um, as amended through this discussion? Sir, is there a motion to approve? I move approval. Is there a second? Yes, Terry. Okay. Um, any further discussion? Um, hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? So, Mike, with the council members now present, we have approval. We'll now have to go back and with those council members that were not be were not able to be with us today. Um, right. Figure out what's the best way to get this formally approved by the um, a council, given this input. Yeah, yeah, we'll we'll reach out to those members. We'll be able to append some sort of digital uh, indication from them as part of the minutes. Uh, and then, you know, you can take up approval of minutes at the next regularly scheduled meeting. Uh, so, uh, you know, that would, that's, that's sufficient for us to do. Cause of course we don't, we don't, you know, as you know, we don't actually need a formal vote, even though it's our practice to the, the council directs us these, it's not statutorily a matter of, of requirement that we, uh, to submit the DPs, the decision packages that we have, have the vote. So that, that should enable us to do that, uh, and then uh, just one, I don't know if anyone has any questions on that, but happy to entertain that, but also to mention that uh, there has, uh, we initially meant for this the conversation to occur at the September meeting that was regularly scheduled. Uh, so that was meant to be this meeting. Uh, and so we have recommended that, uh, you know, since we've, we've taken care of this now that we cancel the September meeting, which means our next meeting of the full council would be in November. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, obviously that's a decision ultimately up to the you know chair executive committee go along, but I want to make sure we had share that out in front of everyone. Now. Yeah. And executive committee talked about this on Friday. We we're in agreement with that, unless there's some special need that arises that, that we would maybe need a brief uh, piece of that meeting on the 16th to, to uh, handle some business that's not expected at the time. But given, given that this was what going to be the main agenda item, plus just the amount of work to get these proposals into OFM by September 13th. And the fact that we're still dealing with the pandemic and we are actually short, we are short staffed at WASIC right now. Um, we feel the executive committee feels it's best to, to um, we'll hold the date, but with the intention that we're very unlikely to use that date for a formal meeting. Okay. Mike, is there any other business to be brought to the group before I ask for any nope. other public comment? No, nope, that takes care of anything we would be putting before you. Great. Well, I'm going to open it up to public comment. I, you know, like I said, we oh, in the past, we've always encouraged people to, as we discuss things, just to share their thoughts and views as we go through the meeting. Um, so, but if if anyone has any comments they'd like to, or thoughts they'd like to share before we adjourn here, uh, please uh, please uh, let us know. Anything from the, our guests? I am not seeing anything, Mike. So, I think we can. Uh, take a motion to adjourn and we've uh, hopefully we've given back some time to all of our guests and to our council members. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Okay, I'm taking that. I'll, I assume there's a robust second and we're gonna adjourn. Okay guys, take care. Thank you everyone. Thank you everybody.